last time in Noel's Retro Lab. Oh, okay. This is very good. That looks really bad. For some reason, the power here just went away, which is not good. And you can definitely see how it's moving. So to fix this, I will just melt the solder around the joint and then add some extra fresh solder. And now for the frilly concussion. Hmm? Fr oh, thrilly, thrilly, got it. Sorry, okay, go again. And now for the thrilling conclusion. All right, so we have power and we're back just like we were before. Now we can go back and focus on the main problem, which is still the data bus. The data bus doesn't look good. And in particular, D2 is always zero with a lot of noise. So that would be this one. And that one corresponds to U22. Let me double check that. Yeah, that's D2. So it doesn't get any hotter than the rest in particular, at least that I can't tell with my finger. But I suppose we could try removing it and then seeing if that data bus looks any different. So I removed the RAM chip and it made no difference. The bus still looks exactly the same. So I started looking to see if there was any other clues as to what might be wrong. Because at this point, there aren't that many things left connected to the data bus. We have the CPU, which could be bad, but we saw that memory test kind of work at one point. So, I mean, it's possible, but it's weird that it would be mostly working and then not work anymore. The RAM chips, is a definite possibility. I mean, they could very easily all be bad. And then the CIAs are also connected to the data bus. Other than that, there isn't that much more left connected. I know the, the VIC chip is connected, but the one is working fine. So looking around, one thing that I noticed is that I measured the resistance between each data line and ground, and most of them are pretty low. That's 84 kilo ohms. This one we have. 62 so they're you know they're all more or less like that except for the chip we just pulled out this one is actually 4.1 mega ohms so that's interesting that the one that we pulled out is like that and i thought okay well maybe the chips are busted right and we remove the chip which is the lowest path of resistance but it turns out that it is still 1.3 mega ohms so I don't know exactly what's going on. I don't know if we pulled out the one weird one and all the other ones are busted, but the RAM is pretty likely that it's bad. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just for now remove one other one. And in particular, I'm gonna remove this one because I remember this was one of the data lines that was mostly high, whereas the other ones were mostly low. That way that will let me know if that was coming from the uh, RAM IC or from somewhere else. And then we'll do that measurement and most likely we'll go ahead and remove all the RAM chips and socket them because it's always a very nice thing to have them socketed to replace them or even to test um, RAM chips from a different computer, things like that. So, but let's start with that one. So the chip is removed and check in again from data in to ground. Okay, so we get 4.2, very similar to this other one. Yep, pretty much the same. And then the chip itself, this is the new one that I just pulled out. Wow, so it's also 1.2. So really the only way to measure 64 kilo ohms that we were getting must be through some other path involving the inside of the, of the IC and going through some of the other pins. So interesting. So yeah, at this point, we might as well finish this only eight of them, remove the other six ICs, socket them, and run the test again. That will give us a, a new baseline and we remove completely the, the RAM from the equation. Okay, so all the memory is out and let's see if that makes a difference to the bus, to the data bus. That looks about the same. Looks a little better. It's just noise. It's pretty similar. I'm starting to wonder if this is a CPU thing. The 
maybe CPU is just the bit three is just not working and it puts noise instead. I mean, it could be coming from the CIA chips. It's a possibility. But, you know, at this point, we've removed so much that, you know, might as well. And just like magic, the CPU is desoldered and socketed. Hmm, I wish it were like that in real life. Anyway, let's put in another CPU, another 6510 that I know it's working. There we go. And let's test that. And it looks like it's the same. Nothing comes up on the screen and the data bus looks very similar to how it looked before. So darn, that was not it. And you know, sometimes this happens with repairs. We start with the most likely candidates based on what we're seeing. So the RAM, then you know, we removed the ROM and the SID, of course, and then we moved on to the CPU. And you know, sometimes it's the last thing you look at. Well, always the last thing you look at, but you know what I mean. <laughs> you look at a lot of things before that one. So really next, the only thing that we have left is the CIA chips. So I'm going to remove those. Those are not essential for um, starting up the computer, well, for the dead test cartridge. So I can just remove them completely and try it again with the dead test cartridge. CIAs are removed and still nothing. So. This is turning out to be a really ugly repair. This is just one of those that it's the opposite of those elegant ones that we look at the board, we make a deduction, remove one chip and boom, everything works. Those are awesome. This is exactly the opposite. So before going any further, I actually went ahead and socketed the RAM and put some new RAM just to make it easier to get some kind of output in the diagnostics cartridge. Because without the RAM, I expect that all we're gonna get is some kind of flash in white and that's easy to miss. So fine, I'll put new RAM and I tested it and still nothing, completely black screen. The data bus still looks the same. So we are really not making any progress with this. So probably the next best thing to try is the color ROM or really it's static RAM, that's a 2114. I've never seen it lock up the system completely, but we really don't have much else to try. So we might as well start doing that. Actually, I changed my mind. I decided that instead of desoldering the color ROM, instead I would desolder this chip next to it, U27, just because it's a MOS chip. Seriously, whenever you have any doubt, those are very unreliable. So if you get to a dead end or at a place that several chips could be suspect, start with the MOS ones. It's not the first time that I've repaired a Commodore 64 blindly by you know, pretty much looking, okay, I have something left, pick the MOS chip, that was the bad one. So, and the good thing about this one is that this is an equivalent of a 74 LS, what is it, 08, I think. So it's like a quad NAND gates, no, AND gates, I'm sorry. And I had checked it before with the oscilloscope before because one of them is the ready signal, and I saw that that one seemed fine, but you know they have such bad reliability issues that I figured it's easy enough to pull out and we have an easy way to test it. One of the lesser known advantages of this particular EEPROM programmer, and I'm sure many others, is that it can actually check not just EEPROMs or ROMs, but actually you can also check logic chips. So we can pop this one in like that. And then we can tell it that we want to test at 74LS08, which is the end. And wow, check that out, it fails. So yeah, this was a quad, probably and I think it was. And as you can see here, two of them passed. So maybe that's one of the ones that I looked at before. I looked at the ready signal, but two of them are not passing. Okay, let's give it a try with the new AND chip. Oh, wow, there we go. Wow, okay, that doesn't look like much, I know, but this is miles beyond getting a black screen like we we're getting before. So this is, this is fantastic. So one very likely cause of the garbled screen that we're getting is the two multiplexers those take the addresses from the address bus and send them over to the RAM 
as column address or row address. So if those are wrong, we'll see mostly garbage. They tend to fail a fair amount, even though they're not MOS. But um, let's go ahead and you know, test them out and um, socket them and see if that's a problem. Since this is standard logic, we can use the same trick again and test it with the EEPROM programmer. OK, that one passes. And let's test the other one. OK, also passes. All right. So at this point, we don't have much else that is untested. So I just spent a while making sure that all the connections from the VIC graphics chip were going correctly on the data bus to the CPU and to the you know, different buffers and like some of the address lines from the VIC chip are mixed together with the address lines coming from the multiplexers with those resistor packs. And so I checked that there was continuity there and everything seemed to be fine. So I've already ruled out that there's anything wrong with this particular VIC 2 chip because I put it on a different Commodore 64 and it works fine. But because I can't find anything else remotely that could be going wrong here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace it and I'm going to put the VIC 2 chip from a different Commodore 64. And as you can see, this is a different version. This is the, I think this is the original one, like that's probably R1. This is R3. This is the gold plated one, but it's the same chip and it's compatible and everything. So it shouldn't make a difference, but I'm running out of ideas. So let's try that. Okay, let's try the new VIC chip. Oh. Wow, that flashing is actually, uh, I guess it's really good. That means that the dead test cartridge is detecting that some of the RAM is not working correctly. But why would that start with the new VIC-2 chip? That's really bizarre. So how many? One, one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hmm. So I need to look it up in the manual and the different number of flashes means it's one of those eight chips. And if there are more than one, apparently you need to replace it and then you run it again and it, it tells you which one is next. Actually, let me turn it off and on again and see if it one. Oh. So now it says that one is bad. Now, I have not tested those RAM chips, but they came from my new stash. I'm willing to believe that one of them is not working, but really two of them out of the eight. That sounds like there's something else going on. Okay, so eight flashes is U21 and one flash is U12. Let's swap those out with the ones that originally came with the machine. Okay, and let's see. So now we get three flashes. Yeah, so what's going on? Is he going to tell us that everything is incorrect now? But, but it's so surprising that now we're getting that bad RAM report and before we're just getting garbled pixels. Oh, this capacitor is broken. You can't barely see it there. That's a better angle. Look at that. That leg is broken. Interestingly, this capacitor, its job is to make sure that the RAM chips all have proper 5 volts all the time. So it's between 5 volts and ground. So I wonder if this is why we're getting errors from the ROM test right now. You know, before we do anything else, um, let's fix this cap and see if anything changes. But I wonder if this could be the cause of some of the weirdness that we're seeing. Okay, we have the new capacitor. I left the RAM the way it was before, so two of the RAM ICs are the original ones and the other six are the new ones, but when we left this, it was giving us errors, I think like three flashes. So let's see what we get now. Now we're still getting flashes, so that wasn't it. How weird. I was convinced that that was a logical explanation. Okay, so at this point, I think we might as well replace the RAM chips with the original ones and see if that um, makes the RAM test pass. All right, let's try it again. 
no flashes so far. The question now is whether we get the test screen and whether it looks okay. Wow. And that looks perfectly fine. Okay, let's let it run all the way. And then if everything looks okay, with the RAM the way it is right now, let's put the, the original VIG2 chip and see if we get any errors with that one or any screen corruption. So obviously we get to the sound test and we don't hear anything because the SID is missing but everything else looks good and it just starts over again. Okay, well, let's do it with the other graphics chip. Let's try it again. No flashing, that's good. And it looks totally fine. Wow, so it just did not like my replacement memory, which is just TMS 4164, 15 nanoseconds. Well, the fact that this RAM passed the tests with this VIC chip and it didn't pass the test with the other one, that still blows my mind. Uh, I have not been able to formulate a theory of why that is even possible. So, okay, <laughs> at least after all this effort, as I said, this is the ugliest Commodore 64 repair I've ever done. We still have a few things to do. We have to put the ROM back, we have to put the PLA back, the SID back, make sure all that works okay. Okay, so I put all the chips back. And really the only change that we made to the original configuration is that I have the new AND gate in there. And let's just make sure that everything works with the dead test cartridge. Uh, this is taking too long. We should have gotten something already. Wow, so there, there is something, I mean, probably the PLA. When, the, when you get a black screen, first knee-jerk reaction should be bad PLA. <laughs> All right, let's put back the original PLA, or not the original, but the one that I was using for the tests. And try it again. So yeah, it looks like we had a bad PLA in addition to that. Okay, and now let's remove the dead test cartridge and see if all the ROMs are okay. And we start in the basic prompt. There we go. Oh, no, there we go. No, <laughs> we don't get the basic message. So maybe the basic ROM is bad. Um, I think it's that one. So I misspoke earlier and this is the basic ROM. So I have a spare one, well, not a spare one, but I'm borrowing this one from another Commodore 64 that was already socketed. So we're going to pull this one out and make sure it's the same one. Yeah, and put in the new basic ROM, like that, and let's test it. There we go. That's great. So looks like we had a bad ROM and a bad CMOS chip and bad PLA. Actually, let's check the PLA. Uh, sometimes having a bad ROM, it can mess enough with the bus that maybe another chip seems that it's wrong, it's it's faulty, but it, it may not be. Let's put back the original PLA. Yeah, okay, it, it does look bad. That's not, that's not good. Okay, so three chips, all in all. PLA, basic ROM, and MOS logic. Wow, that took a lot of effort and it was really ugly. So to get everything working, we had to fix or replace the power connector, the small logic MOS chip, the PLA, the basic ROM, and maybe we didn't have to, but we did, that electrolytic capacitor with a broken leg. Along the way, we desoldered everything on the board, and it may seem like a waste of time, but actually it's super handy to have a Commodore 64 board with everything socketed 
so it will make future repairs a lot easier. It's just too bad that I'm not going to be the one keeping that board, but somebody will be lucky enough to have it and it will come in really handy. So even though this was a pretty ugly, well, no, actually a really ugly repair, I still like to try and learn something from it. So one of the big questions or one of the big things that will help me in future repairs is what was preventing the machine from starting up or even from displaying anything with the dead test cartridge? So I want to go back and look at the MOS chip that failed here. This is a set of four AND gates, so it's a 74LS08. And specifically, when we looked at it with the EEPROM programmer, it detected that gates 2 and 4 had errors, and 1 and 3 were working correctly. So unfortunately, 3 was the one that I had looked at before. It was the ready signal. That one is always high, which I think is fine, given the situation of the computer right now running the test. The, I hadn't looked specifically at 2 and 4. The signal generated by the second gate is CAEC, which stands for CPU Address Enable Control. And honestly, I'm not very clear on what exactly it does. I've looked it up. There isn't much information out there. It may even seem to have something to do with DMA from memory expansions. I don't know in what other circumstances it's used. And I mean, here it looks like there's a fair amount of activity. Actually, right now, just by looking at the oscilloscope, it looks to be mostly fine. Um, so it could be an intermittent problem because here we have some pulsing, here we have high, so ending the two should give us the same pulsing. The one that is definitely incorrect is gate four, which is the chip enable for the color RAM. So as you can see again, here we have one, this is one of the inputs, it's always high, this one is pulsating, so the output should be, the end of the two should be the same pulsating, and instead is always high, which means this is a negative chip select, so color RAM is never selected. So that might explain why we're getting that black screen. Maybe things were working fine, it's just that the characters were always drawn as black, everything was black. So that's, a, that's an interesting possibility anyway. So at least that gives us a better idea of what it meant for those two gates in this chip to fail. And while we're here, there was a question that came up when I was talking with Adrian from over at Adrian's Digital Basement about this weird repair. He actually wasn't sure if the dead test cartridge would work if we had no RAM whatsoever. I was assuming it would, because to me, a RAM test in ROM that doesn't work when the RAM doesn't work, it's kind of pointless. But he had a good point that maybe for the 6510 processor, it's hard to write something that doesn't use any RAM. So I think it should work. So let's test it. I pull them all out. Everything else is working on the board, except that the chips are out. And yep, there you go. We see some flashes. We actually see one flash. So if I replace the chip that corresponds to one flash, let's see. Yeah, I think it's this one. So I'm gonna do it right now. I'm gonna replace it and if all goes well, we should see a different pattern. Okay, let's try it. Now it's still one flash. Yeah, this flashing mechanism to report which RAM chip is bad is actually notoriously unreliable. So um, don't go crazy if you ever find that the pattern doesn't match the RAM IC that isn't working correctly, especially if you have multiple ones. But the important thing to know is that this test works perfectly fine even if you have no RAM ICs at all on the board. That's going to be very useful for future repairs. So I'm sorry that was such an ugly repair. I hope you at least learned something from it. I know I did. But just in case, I think right after this, I'm going to go back and record a message to warn future viewers about the ugliness of what they were about to see. If you stuck it this long, maybe you enjoyed it. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I promise you the next one is not going to be so much of a mess. See you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.